There's some aspects of cars that are more complicated than others. Wheels are on the more complicated part of the scale. Modeling a tire's grip is right at the end of that scale. The interaction between the tire and the ground created by the slip angle deforms the carcass. This is the primary aspect of the wheel, but the deformation also affects the aerodynamics. Depending on the proximity of the sensitive aerodynamic components, this will weight the priority given to its aerodynamic influence. The open wheeler's sensitivity is driven by the near complete exposure to the airflow. Shrouding the wheel in bodywork reduces the sensitivity, however it really just shifts the complexity. Just like all my other videos, I'll be running simulations of the theory that I will outline next. To preview the results, the things that I thought were going on weren't exactly accurate and it appears that I'm not the only one with these misconceptions. Though my misconceptions may be a bit different from others. One example is the air vents at the back of the wheel. These don't seem like a good idea. The problem of the wheel in the wheel well has been well studied. All car and vehicle aerodynamic books have some mention of the wheel. I first read about this subject in Joseph Kratz's Race Car Aerodynamics Design for Speed, first edition. It's a really good book, but the part about the wheels is a bit short. It gave me the wrong impression about venting air at the top of the wheel well. I'll address this topic of venting in my simulations. There are a couple of papers that I've found worth mentioning among others. And it's just a selection, this video won't have an extensive literature review. The first is from 1993, is more of an overview of production car aerodynamics. I thought this image was a nice illustration of the cars that came before this period and reflects the same issues that I'm having with my model. An early study of the wheel wells, this paper documents an experiment of a bluff body with rotating wheels. Pressure taps were located on the inside of the wheel well, and these measurements represent the lower air pressure around the rear of the wheel. Without the wheel well cover, the pressure distribution is similar. The best paper I found is one from Daimler Chrysler from 2007. This ticks all the right boxes for a good quality reference. Images of the flow structure around the wheel isn't the point of this video, but it is a helpful way to see the images and primus for the simulation results. What is clear is that most of the wheel is surrounded by low pressure air, apart from the front where it is contacting the ground. Us human brains easily can understand how this high pressure region forms, and the air gets caught between it and the road, squirting it out to the side. Here is an image with that explanation, but what about why is there a low pressure behind? The image just pretends that it's not there and we move on. Asking why it's a low pressure behind, again our human brains say, well, it's the opposite to the front. Which is correct, however, a contrarian response isn't an explanation. So just a brief explanation, and I'll use all this theory to finally look at the simulations with wheel arch modifications. And originally I was going to do a full analytical analysis of the wheel by breaking down the Navier-Stokes equation to generate a velocity and pressure gradient equation, but I think I'll save that for another video. I think a lot more can be said about the wheel's aerodynamics, expressed in an analytical form. But to give an overview of the problem, it is a problem driven by the boundary conditions and the corresponding shear stress. With the wheel moving forward in a direction, its surface is moving with the same velocity as the ground. We can assume the tire is in a perfect seal or at least this is the problem space. We can say that it's open at the front, but much smaller than the gap generated by the wheel radius. Finally, the Reynolds number is low due to the characteristic length being small, and therefore the flow is laminar. This results in a pressure gradient driven by the wall velocities, driven by the air velocities and the air flowing back towards the contact patch of the tire. Something like this. We can also play around with the mass flow at either end. Now the simulation results. I'm comparing four different models with a model previously tested. The only modification was done to the wheel arch. The original idea was to draw air out the wheel well, lowering the pressure under the car. The previous test was done with a traditionally louvered vent on top of the wheel arch. The results weren't conclusive. It removed a bit of excess lift. It looked as though it was just separating the flow over the top of the wheel arch, therefore reducing the lift. The next models are moving the separation behind the apex and then adding a flap in two cases. The results were consistent, but not that much changed. 
The difference was a tiny reduction in the front lift, accompanied by the loss of rear downforce, or with a reduction in drag. Any difference was with the last model, where a largest flap was added to the trailing edge. This reduced lift by 35 newtons at the front. Anyway, these numbers aren't the interesting bit. I can't really tell much from them, so I extracted the pressure normals from a line along the surface of the wheel and the wheel arch. The plot on the wheel nicely correlates to the results seen in the theory. Each line represents a pressure value normal at the surface. All these plots reflect the results from the simulation. There isn't a large amount of variety, but I think we can glean some information from this. Without extracting the drag forces from the wheels independently, the higher drag results have a larger amount of low pressure behind the wheel. Therefore, there's some drag coming from the wheels. Adding the same plot over the wheel arch, we can see that each configuration beyond the baseline has a low pressure on top of the arch. The louvers disrupt this. The third case, V2C, shows an interaction between the wheel and the wheel arch. The important and direct comparison is between V2A and V2C. The only change in geometry is the increase in the size of the exit. Due to CAD modeling issues, there was a gap between the body and the wheel arch. I managed to solve this with the last case, V2D. I would suggest that the difference between the last case and the rest is just exaggerated. But the delta over all the cases is so small, it can be assumed that the first three cases would only be marginally better. However, applying the underfloor plot, the characteristics between all four cases are just the same, only exhibiting shifts in magnitude, reflecting the similarities of the overall numbers. The baseline V1i shows a different characteristic plot, which makes sense as the results have a different front to rear balance. Lastly, there is an interaction between the wheel arch and the bonnet, or hood if your country is upside down. There is definitely some potential to modify this part of the car. The conclusion I draw from these cases is that the downforce can be gained altering the wheel arch. Holes on the rear of the wheel arch is unlikely to achieve anything. Removing the low pressure above the wheel arch is likely a good simple step. The inherent low pressure region behind the wheel is caused by its rotation and would likely need separate bodywork treatment than at the top of the wheel.